Good afternoon. Did he just bring a book on stage? Oh, my Lord, this is going to be a boring speech. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. As I tend to do, I made a revision to my comments yesterday because I got to do a breakfast discussion. And at the breakfast discussion, I was talking to a group of financial analysts and investors. These are people whose job it is to take millions, tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of dollars of other people's money and put it into the energy space to try to get a return. So we sat down for a breakfast and they asked me a range of questions. Ryan, what about all the natural gas flaring in the Permian Basin? Ryan, what about refining capacity and the expansions? Ryan, what about the shortages in pipeline capacity to move all these products around? Ryan, we're, we want to understand what all is coming. In particular, they asked about this recent attack in Saudi Arabia where a drone, apparently from Iran, flew into Saudi Arabia and hit a large terminal, large storage, large production facility and wiped out 5 million barrels of crude oil production. Ryan, what does all this mean? As we talked about what was happening in market conditions and infrastructure and all these sort of things, guys were in there taking tons of notes. And toward the end of the conversation, one of the analysts says, Ryan, what do you think the biggest risk is? And I said, well, you know, we talked about a bunch of risks. He said, no, no, no. I don't mean to any specific set of the industry or any particular place in the value chain. I mean, Ryan, you've talked about all the massive opportunities that there are in front of us. Ryan, what do you think the primary risk is to the state of Texas, to the United States, as we look at these opportunities? Now, to remind you how big these opportunities are, the United States today is producing over 11 million barrels a day of crude oil, getting close to 12 million barrels a day. We have between 18 and 19 million barrels a day of refining capacity. We have more, we have about 90 billion cubic feet a day of natural gas production, which is roughly one-fourth of the world's gas production. The United States today, and specifically Texas, handles more hydrocarbon than anyone else in the world by a healthy chunk. Yes, Saudi Arabia and Russia produce a lot of oil. Russia produces a lot of natural gas. But they can't, they can't even touch us on refining capacity. Yes, China is building a lot of new refineries. And they are the number two refiner in the world. They have virtually no oil or natural gas. Yes, other countries, especially in Europe, are looking to build new pipelines to move product. They don't have the development capacity that we do. When you link all those things together, from the well, to the gathering facility, to the pipeline, to the terminal facility, to the fractionation facility and the refinery, back into a pipeline either to an export facility or to a power generation plant, no one holds a candle to what we're doing. So if you're a kid growing up in Texas today, you're in high school and you're about to go to college, and you ask mom and dad, hey mom and dad, you know, where are the opportunities? It is hard not to point at energy and say, you know, son, you know, daughter, we're going we're gonna to be a leader in energy for a long time. And that's going to mean opportunities for every single one of us. And not just those who work in the energy business. I'm talking about people who work in transportation or in technology or in manufacturing for whom energy is their largest single cost except for people. They get an advantage versus all of their overseas competitors because our energy is so affordable and so reliable. That's the opportunity. So I'm sitting there with this group of investors, and one says, uh, Ryan, what do you think the biggest single risk is? You know, it's funny. After doing this for five years and giving talks like this all over the place, you think I would have had that question like that before, and I hadn't. So I sat there, and I, I thought, we, we talked a bit about infrastructure. We talked about people. People in the job, my friends from San Jacinto College who are trying to make sure we have enough people to run facilities. We talked about infrastructure. We talked about the Permian Basin, roads, traffic. But as I was leaving there that day, my mind went to 
a more philosophical thing. And that's what I want to spend most of my time talking about today. I think the number one thing that stands in the way of the United States and the state of Texas being a superpower in energy, dominating energy, is one thing. And it's fear. In 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected to the presidency. We had experienced, you know, four years of the Depression. Unemployment was skyrocketing. Uh, Roosevelt beat his Republican incumbent, uh, Hoover, in a landslide victory. And in his, in his inaugural address, just a few lines in, Roosevelt says his famous line, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Now, a little history. If you ask most historians, most economists, what was it that actually drove the United States out of the depression, out of the recession, out of a really slow economy? Most will point back and say it actually wasn't Roosevelt's New Deal policies. What to look back and say, it was actually World War II. They'll say the investment that all of us made in each other, in new military spending, in new technology to win that war is what drove the country out of the Depression. Now you may say, well, okay, so while he predicted we have no thing, nothing to fear but fear itself, it wasn't the fear he was talking about. It was the fear of a foreign power that drove us out of the Depression. I submit to you it was for this reason. It was that fear that brought us together. It was in 1941, after, the, after Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, that Americans united behind an idea that we are going to go do this together. The fear from each other that would follow in the rest of Roosevelt's speech was gone. If you listen to all the lines in Roosevelt's speech in that inaugural address, he talked a lot about how most of the country was the victim of bankers, the victim of industrialists. In 1941, 41 in 1942 no one cared about that people said let's go defend our nation defend our friends let's go be who we are going to be together and it was that spirit that drove us out of the depression well here we are today and we hear a lot of the same language that you would have heard back then you can hear in the language of politics people attacking one another constantly Negative things, challenging things, blaming things. Where is the optimism? Where is the excitement? When you think about the world around us today and the fear that is kind of ingrained in the way we talk about things like politics, there is a role, a very specific role that falls on all of us. It is the role of a leader. Fear is a very natural human emotion. In fact, in 1943, a psychologist named Abraham Maslow would become the godfather of the, human, of the psychology of human possibility. You know, his predecessors at the time, guys like B.F. Skinner and Freud, had a very psychoanalytical way of looking at the world. They looked at the world in, in, in terms of what our negative potential was, the things that, that undermine us. Maslow said, you know what, I don't subscribe to that. Maslow said, I believe that humans have unlimited possibilities, unlimited potential. But in order to understand that, we have to understand what motivates people. And Maslow went out and worked with communities, worked with businesses to do experiments, which were really just data gathering in real world all the time. And Maslow came up with what he called his hierarchy of human need. It was a triangle. Very simple. And if you Google Abraham Maslow and the hierarchy of needs, you'll find out that what I'm telling you is nothing creative. Wikipedia can tell you the same thing. This triangle is this triangle of human, and he had, there were five categories of human needs that drove motivation. The bottom one, the first one, was sustenance. Food, water, basic survival. The next one above that, number two, is safety. Now Maslow would tell you, if you ever heard him in a lecture, he would have said, actually, those two can reverse. If I've got enough food, I've got enough water, however I'm afraid for my life, all of a sudden safety becomes my primary motivation. But safety, food, and water, safety and, and sustenance were the bottom two motivations. The third one in his group of five was what he called belongingness. We might call it love. That human beings are motivated 
After they have safety and food and water, they're motivated by the need to belong. His last two were what he called um, confidence and then self-actualization. He said in the fourth one, he said, at the end of the day, we want to feel like we're important, we're valued. We want to have some esteem is actually what he called it. Your esteem was the fourth one. I wanted to have esteem. If I am well thought of by my peers, I'm valued by the people around me. That was the fourth one. And then the fifth one was what he called self-actualization. Self-actualization is that each of us has unique gifts, unique skills. And we really have a desire to put those to use. The very talented musician wants to be a musician. The geek engineer wants to do geeky engineering things. The great teacher, the great educators want to inspire and teach other people. People who have a fascination with health and human body want to be doctors and take care of people. That's what he called self-actualization. So important did Maslow believe this idea of self-actualization that as he studied people in all of these field experiments and companies, what he found was that people who were experiencing self-actualization were so unique that he actually described them as almost a different breed of person. To be around someone who was living in self-actualization, that their confidence level, their spirit, their excitement for life made them different than everybody else. It was Maslow's hierarchy of need. But we have to go back to, before I can get to all that top stuff, I've got to satisfy the bottom stuff. And one of those first things is fear. If I'm experiencing fear, then that trumps everything else above it. Now, the role as leaders for us is to take people around us out of that. In fact, the book I brought up here today is a relatively new one. It came out earlier this year, and it's by Gallup. Now, everyone knows, oh, Gallup poll this or Gallup statistics this. Gallup is a, is a numbers group, a statistics group. And earlier this year, they published a book, and Jim Clifton is the primary author. If you have not heard Jim Clifton's name, you may have heard of his book or his process called Strength Finders. There's a book called Strength Finders. You go in, you can enter a bunch of, ask a bunch of questions, and it'll come back and tell you what are the natural things you draw to. But this book, they, the title of the book is called It's the Manager. And the reason I brought this up here is there's a couple of pieces of data that I want to speak to about leadership. Now, first of all, how big was this study they put into this book? Let me read a couple of lines. Our work included tens of millions of in-depth interviews of employees and managers across 160 countries. That's where the data came from this book. We conducted roundtable interviews with chief human resource officers from 300 of the world's largest organizations. And their primary conclusion right here in like the first three pages of the book is Gallup concludes, based on all these interviews and these studies, that the world's most serious short-term, five to ten year, problem is declining economic dynamism and declining productivity by GDP per capita. So in discussing all of these interviews and all of these organizations, Gallup says, man, we're not as economically dynamic as we used to be. Hence the need for leadership. One last thing from this book. Gallup goes on to describe that when you think about growing companies, yes, the top one, the, the Dow Jones Industrial is growing like crazy. And they say in this book, that the primary strategy of most Fortune 1000 companies is acquisitions. However, while these companies have grown through acquisition, they've grown in size, what they've done is eliminated competitors. In the last 20 years, the number of publicly traded companies has dropped from 7,300 to 3,700 through consolidation. Yes, the companies are growing bigger, but their value in terms of GDP per capita has not. One final statistic that's not in this book. If I asked you, what is the growth in GDP per capita right now? How much are we adding to society in terms of our value, our ability to produce? If I, if I uncouple or if I take out inflation and I told you that the average American, the average American, so I take GDP, total GDP divided by American, 20 years ago was $50,000. Today it's $57,000. That's 0.7% per year growth for every man, woman, and child in the United States. So the idea is, as a people, 
We are only growing our productivity by 0.7% per year. Now, actually, this on trend is not that different from most of history. In other words, if you go back to the 1950s or the 1930s, you know, through depressions and everything else, actually, the average is around 1%. This really isn't that big a change. Here's the reason, though, that I say fear is our biggest risk. We live in an age where information is available immediately. If I'm sitting at the table today and somebody recommends a book on behavioral economics or communication skills or oil and gas industry trends, I can have that book in my house in a day, order on Amazon, send, and I can have it electronically in my hand in 30 seconds. We have information available to us almost immediately. We have better technology to make us more productive. And yet with all this technology, all this information, all this infrastructure, we are not growing our productivity faster today than we have any other time in history. As leaders, our job is to challenge that norm. Our job is to let people know, hey, we have safety and sustenance. Now it's our time to go out and do bold things together. How do we as leaders shape the world around us? In fact, let me do a quick poll. How many of us in the room say, yes, I am a leader? I'm going to need a show of hands. I'll stand here awkwardly until I get a show of hands. Okay, all of you who didn't raise your hand, you are lying. We are genetically designed to be leaders. Well, Ryan, uh, I don't know if you can say that. I mean, you're not a psychologist or a psych. How do you say that? Because we're all genetically designed to be parents. There is no leadership role that we will take on in our lives more important than that of a parent. And one thing about parenting, whenever any of us got into it, we were all doing it for the first time. As a parent, yes, we have to take care of our kids, make sure that they are fed and watered. We have to make sure that they are loved. But our proudest days as parents are not the days where our kid ate another meal. They're the day that our kid did something special, something unique. It's the day that my son Lance could do math in his head faster than I could, and he was only nine. Those are the days we start to see that unique ability in our children. And the day that our children come home and they say, oh, mom, dad, really tough day at school. You know, junior high is the great equalizer. I think God puts us through junior, li- junior high to remind us all that we are really humble, imperfect beings. Because our friends will tell us about it constantly in junior high. When we are going through school and our kids come home and they say, Mom, Dad, terrible day. I'll, I'm never going to do this. I can't get good enough grades. I can't get into college. I'll never get a good job. No one's ever going to want to love or date me. And we as parents tell our kids, no, that's not true. I do not accept that. We as parents believe in our children more than they believe in themselves. And it's that confidence, that inspiration, that drive that pushes them through junior high and high school and sometimes even college so they come out better on the other side. Great leaders in companies do the exact same thing. Great leaders in companies make people believe in a vision, in an idea that they didn't know was possible before they showed up to work that day. You can think of them. You think of Steve Jobs at Apple and the bold things that Apple did. When the guy running Swatch, if you can remember that company, said, I believe we can make a watch for cheaper than a dollar. And sure enough, Swatch would change the industry in terms of the price of a timepiece. We can remember leader after leader after leader who inspired with a bold idea believed in a group of people more than they believed in themselves, and as a result, bold new things were developed. When I look at what's happening in the energy industry today, this idea of opportunity, of all of this natural resource we have in the ground, especially in the Permian Basin, the technology and the people that we have to pull that natural resource up, the engineering capacity, the construction tools that we have to build pipelines and build systems to move that product, I love talking about refineries because when you look around the world today, there is not a country in the world that doesn't dream of having the refining sophistication that we do. And we take it for granted. How many of us drive around the ship channel every day and 
you know, don't really think of whether or not it's safe to be around these refineries. We assume it is. Remember when the black cloud from the chemical storage facility was over Houston for a few days last year? The, the panic that ensued, we are so not used to We've never seen that before. That is unacceptable. You go to other countries, that's just a regular everyday occurrence. People dream of being where we are in oil and gas. So how do we take that and go to the next level? How do we make sure if someone's starting a new manufacturing facility somewhere in, say, New Mexico or California or Washington State, or they're trying to invent some new technology in Austin or up in the New England area, that energy here gives them an advantage over all of their competitors around the world. We have to make sure that we are inspiring our generation of energy leaders to drive things that have never been done before. Because that's what it's going to take. We already are winning. We're already beating everybody else. In the energy space, these days and for the last 10 years, we've been like, and you've got to know how much it pains me to say this, we've been the Alabama. I know. I know. I'm an Aggie. Kills me to say it. But we've been the United States and Texas have been the Alabama of energy as, as Alabama is to college football. We have been constantly beating everybody else. And it's easy to sit back and go, ah, man, we're doing all right. And you know that 0.7% number that Sitton talked about? That's not really that big a deal. Let's cruise, man. Now's the time more than ever when we need to be saying, what's the next big thing? And we see some of that stuff going on around us today, not just in private business, not just in education, in big corporations. The talk that the gentleman right before me gave, talking about where they are looking to develop new things in India, new partnerships, that's exciting. And that's where the action is going to come. Now, two other things I want to talk about before I open up for a couple of questions. One, Ryan, you talk about leadership. Give me something. Give me an idea. What, does make, what makes a great leader? I'll give you three things. One, audacious listening. Two, celebration of differences. And three, results, not tasks. Let's talk about audacious listening for a second. Imagine you walk into a room with someone that you're, you're this could be your spouse, this could be your child, this could be a coworker, this could be a supervisor or a subordinate. And you say, you know what, for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to do nothing but ask questions. No statements, no responses. I'm just going to ask questions. What this requires of me as a leader is that when someone gives an answer, I have to really listen to ask a follow-up question. You've all been in a normal conversation that goes like this. Hey, Ryan, how you doing? Man, I'm doing good. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Everything good? Yep, everything good. Great. Good talking to you. You've had that conversation, probably some today. Yeah? How about this? Hey, Ryan, how you doing? I'm doing good. Really? Tell me about that. Well, you know, it's, it's going well. The weather's really crazy outside. And in fact, uh, this morning was kind of, a, kind of a hectic deal. Why? What, what made it a hectic deal? Well, man, my kids are, the kids are out of school, and my, my, son's, my son's actually kind of struggling in school, so missing a day of school is hard for him. Man, what, what is it your son's struggling with in school? Actually, it's, it's math. And that really bothers me because I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm supposed to get this stuff right. My wife's an engineer too. Heck, he's genetically programmed to be good at math. <laughs> All of a sudden, we're having a, a beyond-the-surface conversation. As a society, we've actually, I think, gotten worse and worse at this. I blame social media. I really do. Social media is the opposite of engagement. But how many of my friends sometimes say, oh, man, Ryan, I keep up with you. Oh, really? I, I don't remember talking. No, no, I follow you on social media. That's not the same. While I do appreciate those who follow me on social media, a real conversation used to be something that was, you would do all the time. I think we're getting worse at it. Listening is the ability to really understand what's going on underneath, what's making them tick in those hierarchy of five needs. Which of them is on their mind today? Celebrating differences. This is one that is, sounds easy, but then it, it's hard to exercise. Why? Because the world has made it tough for us to even talk about differences. I recently had a conversation with somebody that works for me, and we were talking about our family upbringing. And this was in the office, talking about family. And he, at one point, was talking about 
growing up and what it was like with his father. And I asked him, you know, what, tell me about the experience. And started talking. he said, Ryan, one thing you have to understand is I grew up in an Israeli Jewish household. Now, immediately, right, you, you know, if those of you have been in this situation, you're like, oh, my God, he brought up religion. <sighs> right? I mean, think about the things that we can't talk about at work. We can't talk about religion. Heaven forbid we talk about politics. And, oh, my gosh, if anybody ever mentions that there is actually a difference between the genders, you go straight to prison. The world is making it hard to talk about our differences and celebrate them. My wife and I are drastically different people. And it is in those differences that we complement each other. And that we make each other and we challenge each other to be exceptional. As leaders, we've got to be willing to put the discomfort aside and rumble through those differences. Now it doesn't mean that differences are always, that, that and those of us with high school kids Oh, no, no, Dad, you don't get it. You're just different than me. I don't want to work. No, that's not a difference. That's laziness. Not always are differences an excuse not to be excellent, but recognizing uniqueness, unique capabilities, unique value. That is what gets people from safety and sustenance to belongingness, to esteem, and to self-actualization. It's that uniqueness that I see in you, that I want to I call out and I want to recognize. I want to celebrate. The last thing is results versus task. As leaders today, it is incumbent upon us to think beyond the day-to-day -day task. Now, once again, the world we live in today celebrates the day-to-day. -day. If you go to anynewswebsite.com, what you'll find is every news story is relevant for about 15 minutes. And then a week later, it's old news. We are so obsessed with the here and now that we as leaders can forget that it's great to be churning, but we got to know what we're churning toward. When I started my company, Pinnacle, now 13 years ago, and it was just me in my garage, and we hired our first employee and the second employee and third employee, one thing I was just blessed with was I was always thinking that way. That same, one of my unique gifts, unique abilities, is I always think up here. Now, when I was in like grade school, that was not considered a blessing. In fact, the teachers told my parents, that kid's ADD, you got to put him on drugs, because I was always thinking up here. But today, when I would hire and talk to new employees about where we're going, why, what we are doing will change the world, that's when people get excited. That's what they can work toward. As leaders, focusing on the result, not the task, is huge. Where are you going? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing it that way? That's up to you. What we want is the result. It's your job. It's our job to figure out how to get there. But let's focus on the result. Audacious listening. Celebrating differences. Driving toward results constantly. Those are things you will see in people around you. And you'll know, man, she's leading. She's pushing us. She's challenging us. One last commentary after five years in politics is that the entire world of politics is absolutely abysmal when it comes to leadership. The things I just talked about, audacious listening, nobody in politics does that. Everything in politics is a statement of who I am and what I believe. When was the last time you heard an elected official of either party get up and say on camera or in a committee hearing, you know, I was, I was listening to what you said, and I found that really interesting. I'd like to hear more. You know what? I was listening to one of my colleagues, and they said something, and I might, it's got me thinking differently because of their ideas. Leaders, we ought to be doing that all the time. Nobody in politics models that. I talked about celebrating differences. Unfortunately, the world of politics has learned something very well. Because that basal, that foundational motivation is fear, Politicians use it all the time. It has become the primary driver of our message. Think about it. Uh, vote for me. Why? Aren't you afraid that that rich guy has all the power and all the money? Vote for me. Vote for me. Why? Because that other politician is going to take away all your power and all your money and give it away to other people. Capitalism and socialism. Vote for me. Why? Because they won't do anything to make sure people don't have guns. Vote for me. Why? Because they want to take away all your guns. 
it is driving fear to drive an action. And so this is modeled around us constantly, using the differences between us to drive us apart. I was up in Tennessee, eastern Tennessee, this last week, and I walked into a general store there, and I, I, saw, I was talking to a woman who worked there. And I asked her about, um, I noticed she had a, a political sign behind her, and so I asked about it. And I said, you know, I find that interesting. Here I am in eastern Tennessee. This is not a wealthy area. And I said, you know, that's interesting. Why have that? What is it? She goes, you know what I'm sick of hearing about? This is a white woman from eastern Tennessee. What, do you say? What, what is it? I'm sick of hearing about white privilege. I was about to get a little political. But she said, I'm sick of white privilege. I said, why, why are you sick of hearing about that? She says, because when I was growing up and my parents were on welfare, was that my white privilege? I, I don't know. She says, when my father got drunk and beat me, was that white privilege? When I couldn't afford to go to college, was that white privilege? When my neighborhood was overrun with meth heads, was that white privilege? At what point in my life have I received a privilege because I was white? She even started to tear up a little bit. She's like, look, I don't, I'm not saying I haven't had good things in my life, but I don't think they were because I was white. Now, whether or not you buy into white privilege or not, and we have a lot of challenging history in our nation when it comes to race and slavery and those sort of things. The fact is, our language today is driving divisiveness. And it's politics driving fear. Our job as leaders is to live differently. It's to say, no, we don't subscribe to that. In fact, if someone starts to use some sort of class warfare or identity politics, we say, look, I'll discuss and debate political ideas with you all day long. I'm not going to participate in that because I don't believe in that. I believe that we all have the same five things that drive us. We all search for belongingness. We all search for self-actualization. And when we do that well together, we're all a better species. We're all better humans. We're all happier people. Now, that may sound soft. It may sound philosophical. Ryan, where's the industry data? Ryan, where's the meat on that bone? I've been very blessed in my life. Pinnacle, the company that my wife and I started 13 years ago, now employs about 850 people. We do business all over the world. And if you ask me, well, Ryan, what was your expertise? What was it? What was, your, what was the thing that you knew, the thing that you did to build that business? Sure had some knowledge around mechanical integrity and reliability programs and refineries and those sort of things. But the things that made our business overall successful was not that I was working to become a better expert in reliability or refineries. It was that I was working to become an expert in people. And that is the lesson that each of us can reab reabsorb, redefine. Today, I, I asked for a show of hands. I said, okay. I said, who's a leader? And some people always raise their hands. Some say, well, I don't know. I don't really know what a leader is, Ryan. I said, no, 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 we're all leaders. We're all called every day to inspire people around us. So my last challenge to you is this. When you go back to work today or your house this evening or you're spending time with your friends, with your family, ask yourself this question. Am I doing the things that inspire people around me to do more than they thought before? Do they believe in themselves more because I believed in them? And are they going to turn around now and model that same challenge to people around them because leadership is contagious? If so, then you represent the best of what we need in leadership, which represents the best of what we need in people. And that's what will make us successful together. Thank you very much for your time today. I've got three questions in four minutes, so watch this. Can you comment on the lack of capacity to export oil slash petrochemical products on inability to widen and deepen the Houston ship channel to allow super tankers? Yes. Uh, in fact, the answer to that question is the question. We have a lack of capacity to export oil and petrochemical products on an inability to what? Yes, 
We need to widen our ship channels. In fact, not just in the, uh, the Houston ship channel, but you'll hear about Corpus Christi, uh, even Port of Beaumont, other ports. One of the things that we are advocating a lot for right now is the fact that the future in energy is certainly here at home, but it's even bigger internationally. The world is hungry for our LNG. They're hungry for our natural gas. They're hungry for our refined products and our crude oil. We've got to be able to get more and more of those products to those countries, and our ability to do that affordably is huge. So I don't have exact numbers for you, but I can tell you that, that we, sh we, me, our congressmen, our governor, uh, our senators, are, need to continue and are constantly advocating to have that expansion done because the economic impacts are bigger than just Houston and the state of Texas. It's for the entire nation. Uh, lots of fear of recession the last few weeks. A recession only comes about due to fear, right? Goes to your point about fear being big risk. Yes, in fact, um, there's a couple things that will drive recessions, and I could get macroeconomics on you, but in short, when you, we, when you are borrowing too much money, what we are producing doesn't match what the demand is, things are overpurchased or overbuilt, that's the economic triggers of recession. And then when you start to see, oh, we had to lay some people off, you start to see slowdowns, that does trigger additional fear, at which point people hunker down. They stop spending money, I'm not going to invest in new things, and so it's, it is a cyclical thing. Fear definitely will have a compounding effect on the economic impacts of, of a recession, turning it into a greater recession and depression until we start to see some optimism. Uh, in what ways does your leadership change while working across generations? Man, what a great question. Uh, how many of us in here have, you can be honest, how many of us have lamented the millennial generation? Yeah? Now, for those of you who are baby boomers, how many of you lamented Gen X before we were talking about millennials? Yeah, my group? Yeah, I see a hand back there, thank you. Yeah, sure, look, one thing to say is there are new trends out there and we have to understand what those new trends are, how we communicate, how we resonate with people. Um, and, and the next generation is always going to not work as hard and not gonna be as diligent as the last generation was. I think that's a universal truth. Now there are some nuances though about the millennial generation that we do need to keep in mind. One is there is a, because we are an economy, we're a society that has so much and we're moving to more and more of a shared economy. Right, when I was growing up I bought CDs no one buys CDs anymore. If you joke about buying a CD, they act like you're 90. Right? They say, no, you just download the music. It's free, idiot. Yeah, I, I got it. Um, same thing with, with books, cars. A lot less people buying cars. If you're under the age of 30, you just Uber everywhere. So in a shared economy where you have a society of plenty, less and less is money becoming a driver. For my generation, money was a huge driver. When I got to college in 1998, who had the biggest salary by a couple thousand dollars a year was a big deal. Kids growing out of college today, one's making 70 grand a year, the other one's making 65, they don't care. By and large, differences in money, the, the status associated with money is not as big as it was for me. Now it is status associated with things like followers and social media. Other things are driving status. Everyone's driven by status. The things that drive in the modern generation are what we need to understand. So what we do with the next generation actually that isn't different is to understand what makes them tick. So whether I'm talking to someone who is 70 years old or I'm talking to somebody who's 20 years old, my job is to try to get to understand what makes them tick. We all have the basic five things. Sustenance, safety, belongingness, esteem, and self-actualization. If I understand, though, that though what drives those things is different and different people, then I need to get underneath them. What is it that drives them? If I understand that, now I'm in a position to lead them to inspire them, to connect with them. Last one here, and then I need to stop. How do I handle failure? It's a very good one, and I could give another 30 minutes on just this. Here's the one thing I'll tell you about failure. One of the biggest myths in our society today is, let me go on this for just a second, failure is not an option. The famous line, Gene Kranz line from, in history from the Apollo 13, what Kranz was actually telling us was not that failure was not an option. It was that failure could not be the end result. People confuse those all the time. They think, oh, no, no, I can't fail because failure is an option. That, that means I'm unsuccessful. I'm not smart. I don't know what I'm doing. I, as a leader, try to tell people all the time, failure is not a bad thing. It is a step in the process. 
Anytime we're going to do something big and bold, I guarantee we will fail along the way. I said earlier, result is what matters. Task is not. Failure is a step in the process. Our job as leaders, my job, is to make sure people understand failure is a necessary step in the process. Not only is it not a bad thing, it's a good thing. I want to experience it, learn from it, and move on as quickly as possible. If I were to sit up here and give you a talk about what I think has made me successful in my life, it is I have failed more than the average person. And result, learned more than the average person. I threw a lot at you today. Thank you very much for letting me spend time with you, and thank you for letting me serve as your Texas Railroad Commissioner.